Oops. Let's, uh, let's unmute. There we go. Here we go. Day three, CAPS Virtual Career Week. Uh, this is that innovative event that you've uh, hopefully been a part of since Monday. Uh, we've put this all together over last month with a lot of uh, fun partners, including Matic and the CAPS Network, uh, to bring people from all over the country virtually to hear uh, again uh, these professionals that are also from all over the country uh, that have had success in their industries and in different career fields. Uh, they're going to share their journeys with you uh, uh, throughout the rest of uh, today and also into tomorrow. Uh, if you've missed a past session, recordings of those sessions are on the website at preparingforpurpose.org. Those not familiar with what CAPS is, it does stand for the Center for Advanced Professional Studies. It's a professional-based learning program for high school students. It involves over 60 programs, 120 school districts across 17 states in two countries. You can learn more about the CAPS Network at yourcapsnetwork.org. As we get going, it's uh, always fun to see where people are joining us. So put in the chat uh, as we continue to build. Uh, special guest, and this is uh, special not only because it's a, a name everybody should know uh, of, of where, uh, where our guest works, but he's a Cedar Falls, Iowa native grad. Uh, he's in Houston, Texas. He works for NASA. Uh, I want to welcome aboard David Lance, uh, and in Houston, we do not have a problem bringing in David Lance, group lead, advanced mission planning team for NASA flight operations. David, we've emailed, we've talked on the phone, now we're face to face. Uh, how are you doing today? Thank you for being with us. I'm doing well. Thanks for asking, Nate. Uh, I'm just, I'm enjoying all the, uh, the locations that are being typed in the chat right now. I think the farthest I saw was uh, someplace in Arkansas so far. Uh, pretty humble to be uh, speaking with with the audience today. So let's uh, let's get right to it. You're going to tell your story of the, the work you do right now. And as as people have questions, go ahead and put those in the chat. We'll get those in. Uh, but uh, David, go ahead and share your screen and, and take us through the work you are doing today and how you got there. Sure thing. We'll do. All right. Can you see the screen? Oh yes, there it is. Awesome. Well, this is a very quick set of charts that I hope provide everyone with a very brief introduction to what NASA flight operations is uh, and how we fit into the, the larger and broader team uh, at NASA and with our industry partners. Uh, so I'll start off with a few more boring slides as I call them, it's text, but it explains a little bit more about what we do and what our vision, vision and mission are. Uh, I won't read these at everyone. Again, in the interest of time, I'd rather get to the, the Q&A and let everyone pepper me, pepper me with questions. But bottom line, NASA Flight Operations is focused on providing support to human space uh, exploration missions, ensuring that all of our partners, whether they be domestic or international, uh, are in alignment with uh, successfully and safely flying our crew members uh, aboard various spacecraft. We have a long history of support uh, back to the 1960s when NASA was initially established. Um, and we had the uh, Manned Space Flight Center here in Houston, uh, which has since been renamed the Johnson, uh, Johnson Space Center. Um, and so we uh, do all the planning, training, and flying of human space uh, missions. So some of our foundations, I'll just touch on the, the high points. One is that we put ourselves out there to have some very essential and core uh, professional excellence competencies. Uh, two, we're aware that the actions that we take or sometimes the inaction that we take can have the ultimate consequence, uh, which may be loss of spacecraft or loss of crew. And then we recognize that our greatest error is um, to have not tried and failed, but that in trying we do not give our best effort. So we focus very intently on making sure we're always bringing our best and that our teams are stepping forward to see our human space flight missions for our nation be successful. So I mentioned that we've been a long, uh, long supporting program, supporting numerous human space flight missions from Apollo, there on the left side of the screen, the space shuttle from the 80s uh, through the year uh, 2011. Um, and then we've been supporting the International Space Station, helping with its assembly, uh, helping with its integration with our international partners, the Russians, uh, Japanese, Canadian, European uh, Space Agency, and the list goes on and on. We have numerous partners with that program. Um, this photo on the right is, is very fun. It shows um, an, the automated transfer vehicle docked at the aft end, uh, which was uh, the European Space Agency's vehicle. It shows the space shuttle uh, attached at, at the, the front of the space station, uh, performing a, an inspection of the thermal protection system. 
uh, it shows a both a progress module and a uh, Soyuz module. Uh, progress is the Russian vehicle for resupply, uh, and the Soyuz is the vehicle that the crew members come and go on. And the photo is taken by crew members who have undocked in another Soyuz capsule and done a fly around of the, of the space station. So really, it was it's kind of the pinnacle of all these different partnerships and spacecraft flying together, working together. This photo, I believe, was taken in 2010 or 2009. We've since retired the space shuttle, uh, but we've been continuing to fly the International Space Station. And this last year, we marked 20 years of permanent human presence in space, uh, which is uh, amazing to think about, humbling to think that we've had crew members, uh, men and women uh, from, from the US, men and women from around the world, in space performing research and, and advancing our ability to uh, perform space exploration. This is just a beautiful shot that I included of a nighttime pass over um, a major city. Uh, I tried to look up where this city was from. Uh, I had this in a chart deck from a long time ago. I, I'm, I'm blanking on it, but if you Google your hometown uh, and NASA and International Space Station, more than likely you'll find an amazing photo taken uh, during the day or at night of where you live. And you might even find a high enough resolution uh, image uh, taken that you can pick out where your house is. So pretty cool. This is the team that I serve on. So uh, for folks uh, who aren't aware what uh, NASA Flight Operations is, uh, we staff the mission control centers for all of our missions. This is a uh, shot of our team during a handover between one shift and another. So you see there's two uh, sets of individuals at each console uh, in this room. Uh, and it's in the midst of uh, an extravehicular activity or a spacewalk. Uh, if you look very closely at the uh, far right screen in the room, uh, my, my picture might be covering that up or something else. Um, but uh, if you look in the top right, uh, there's a, a shot of two astronauts uh, translating across our truss on the International Space Station performing the spacewalk. And so we have a full team, a full complement of disciplines commanding the spacecraft, monitoring telemetry, speaking with the astronauts, and ensuring that they're safe and successful in, in performing repairs or hardware swaps on board. This is just another beautiful shot out of our cupola window on the International Space Station, taken by a crew member looking down, quote unquote, uh, at the Earth as they float over the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this photo is of uh, two of our crew members this last fall uh, who led uh, and conducted the first ever all-female uh, spacewalk. Uh, really exciting time to be working at NASA where we have an extremely diverse workforce and we have an extremely diverse astronaut corps. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that when we talk about some of our future goals for the agency. Which is this slide, good lead in. Uh, so looking forward uh, for the next several years, we have a very audacious goal of putting um, humans back on the lunar surface uh, by 2024. We're calling it Moon 2024. Um, this is a very brief introduction to how those Artemis missions, as we're calling them, Artemis was the twin sister to Apollo, uh, an aptly named uh, set of missions, will get us off uh, Earth's surface, out of low Earth orbit, where we've spent the majority of our time over the last several decades, and back into orbit around the Moon. So starting with Artemis 1, where we're test flying that spacecraft, Artemis 2, where we put humans back in orbit around the moon and we'll actually have humans um, be the farthest distance away from Earth that, they, that we have ever, ever been. Uh, pretty impressive. Some support missions in between as we build up the Gateway, uh, which is an orbiting platform, or you can think of it like space station, around uh, the lunar uh, in, a, in, a, in a couple of different orbits that I won't go into from a technical standpoint, but very exciting spot. And then eventually landing uh, our astronauts, hopefully the first woman and the next man, onto the, uh, the moon's south pole. So this is a very quick flyover of that. Uh, last slide here before we get to q and I wanted to touch on, we have really strong industry partners that we've worked with. Um, I think most folks have heard of SpaceX in the center there. Uh, on the bottom right, it might come through a little fuzzy uh, uh, on the presentation, but we have a national team with Blue Origin, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and Traper. And then on the left, Dynetics. We just announced within the last two weeks that we are partnering as an agency with these companies to take our astronauts safely from our Orion spacecraft on Artemis III and put them back on the lunar surface in 2024. So very exciting to be partnered with these companies in making that happen. So rather than continuing to drone on about all the uh, fun stuff that we're doing at NASA right now, wanted to open it up and see if there's any questions from folks.
So uh, if you've got a question out there, and that's what I, I didn't quite get to. So if you've got something you want to ask uh, David or about NASA or space um, or his awesome flag that he has uh, on, on his picture, uh, go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, we're going to go till 1240 Central Chime, 40 minutes after the hour. Um, so just be aware of that. Uh, looking through the questions right now, so as a flight controller, what's the process for making hard decisions quickly? You know, how do you, how do you, how do you get accustomed to doing that? Because it, it has to happen all the time, right? It does. Uh, there's no set process for that, but there are some, um, some things that we train uh, and we ensure that our teams are proficient at. So to be a flight controller uh, in mission control on our team, uh, you undergo sometimes years of training. Uh, and that starts off, uh, maybe you get a certification in a backroom position. So I showed the front room, which are the folks that uh, are uh, interfacing directly either with the crew or CATCOM or the flight director, uh, who was in the center of, of that photo, to ensure that uh, the activities that we're trying to accomplish and the goals that we have set out are, are being successful. So you might start off in a MIPSER position, learning some of those communication skills that are essential. So you have to be clear, crisp, and concise. You have to be aware of what's going on during the mission uh, so that when you're faced with something that requires quick reaction or, or taking quick action on, on something, uh, you're able to do so and know what the implications or um, the interdependencies with other disciplines or other systems are. And so we spend a lot of time getting folks prepared, not only uh, putting them through training lessons, uh, having them re uh, review manuals, uh, system architecture, uh, supporting meetings, uh, becoming subject matter experts in different areas, but also performing simulations before they ever sit on console and practicing what happens when something goes wrong. Uh, what commands do you send to the spacecraft? What telemetry is important to be looking at? How do you communicate those things to the rest of your team? Uh, so a lot of training, a lot of practice, uh, and a lot of um, memorization and understanding of technical information to prepare you to sit on console. So a graduate from Cedar Falls High School, uh, that's uh, the Cedar Falls CAPS, <clears throat> the program I work with in Northeast Iowa. I graduated from there, uh, move on to Iowa State. How do you end up sitting in that, in that picture in, in the control center uh, in Houston? What talk through your pathway of, of how do you do that? How, do, how did you get there? Sure, uh, so my, my history, like you said, I started off at Cedar Falls High School. I graduated there in 2003. Uh, was accepted into Iowa State in their engineering programs. I decided I wanted to, I went in undeclared engineering uh, for my first semester, wasn't sure quite which specialization I wanted to enter into. Ultimately decided that I couldn't make up my mind between two, so I pursued aerospace engineering and materials engineering. Uh, during my time at Iowa State, uh, we had a very large career fair in the fall and in the spring. Um, and in those years, companies would come in, it was very much a face-to-face -face interaction, exchange resumes, talk about what they have to offer, hopefully you land an interview, and then maybe get a, an internship or sometimes full-time placement with the company. Uh, in the case of NASA, uh, my year there as a, as a sophomore was the first year that they had returned uh, to Iowa State and supported the career fair. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get an interview uh, my fall semester of sophomore year, and then did well enough and was fortunate to be offered a, uh, an opportunity to come down for, uh, at that time it was called the co-op program in sp spring of 2005. And um, now it's called the Pathways Internship Program. So that program's still around. And so that you feel, because you, that was, a, you were a sophomore when, uh, when you went and visited with them during the career fair? That's correct, I was in my first semester sophomore year. Um, what, do you, what do you feel like uh, hindsight now stood out to them um, and wanting to talk to you about uh, an opportunity down there, um, you know, with, with the group as, as a sophomore. What do you feel like uh, prepared you or made you stand up? Sure. Uh, the thing that prepared me was I had gotten into my core curriculum classes very quickly. I had taken um, some summer coursework as well to get ahead since I was doing double engineering degrees. Um, and at the time, and I'm not sure if this is still the case at Iowa State, but or if it's similar at other universities now, but they had fall only, spring only classes, and sometimes they had some opportunities to do get aheads or makeups during the summer. So I took full advantage of that. I was very active in a couple of extracurriculars. So I mentioned the, the career fair, that's actually a student run uh, career fair at Iowa State. And I was on um, the outreach committee. I was actually the chair of the outreach committee there. I was also very active in, in my dorm, dorm room uh, 
uh, house. Uh, Iowa State dorms have houses that are split up, so you have kind of cohorts of individuals living together. I, I believe they still have that. And uh, I was president of my house, so I was very active in my community. Um, I was very active in extracurriculars. I had sought out and been fortunate enough to get leadership positions in those. Um, and in addition to that, I was doing well in school and had decent grades. You don't need to have a 4.0. I did not have a 4.0. Um, that went out the window my first semester freshman year, but um, I was very engaged. I understood that in order to better myself and to be better prepared to be a leader in whatever internship or opportunity came for me during college or after college, I was going to have to start developing those skills uh, through the extracurriculars and leadership activities at college. So, so you did your co-op internship type thing between sophomore, junior year? Did I understand that right? Or was that later that's, on? Cor that's correct. So the way the co-op program was set up and still is set up is it's a multi- <laughs> Uh, term opportunity. And it's required that once you enter into that, you're committing to delay your graduation um, and spend more time on the job training, uh, basically conducting an extended interview over multiple years with NASA. Uh, so for me, what that looked like was I did a spring uh, semester and three summer tours uh, with different teams at JSC in, in Houston. Um, and then at the end of that time, so I, I uh, just to be a little bit more specific, I was with a materials uh, and processes group here on site. I then uh, spent some time with the extra vehicular uh, teams. That's where that photo that I, I flashed on the screen earlier came from. Uh, and then ultimately I ended up in mission planning, um, which is where I'm, where I'm at now. So I was hired in full time in a different team that I had interned with, but it gave me exposure to what flight operations look like. It gave me exposure to what engineering here at JSC looks like. Um, and in doing that and in getting that benefit of having experience, I knew that one, I was interested in working here full time. Two, they were interested in hiring me uh, on, on full time. Uh, and three, uh, that I was committed to delaying my graduation and spending more time at Iowa State in order to see this opportunity come, come to fruition. Well, and yeah, you talk through uh, the value of, you know, people feel like I need to get into college. I want to get out as soon as I possibly can. But taking advantage of those opportunities uh, while you are a college student to, to spend, as you said, three tours in Houston and, and, a, and a spring semester down there. Um, it, do you continue to see that? I guess people that uh, are coming down from colleges uh, across the country, that you see these students coming in as, as co-op workers or interns. Um, how, how are you seeing their experiences different than what you did? Sure. So there are some that are experiencing getting to work at NASA nearly identical to the, the, the opportunity that was presented to me. Um, there are those that get hired, uh, what do you say, fresh out from college as well. Um, we regularly, uh, across all of NASA, not just flight operations, but across all of NASA, put out calls for um, hiring uh, folks that might just be graduating from college or might be graduating within the next semester or six months or so. We have the internship programs. I mentioned Pathways uh, internships, but we also have a program called USRA uh, internships, uh, and they work alongside our teams as well. Pathways is a, um, a federal civil servant uh, route to get, in, get into federal service, uh, but the USRA allows um, our team, um, them to be a part of our contractor team. We're a fairly, um, as we call it, badgeless organization, which means it doesn't matter from a work assignment or leadership opportunity if you are a civil servant or part of the contractor workforce, we try to trust all of our team members uh, with leadership and tech technical excellence. But there are multiple routes in the USR internship uh, program, the Pathways internship, fresh out hires, um, and then also we do um, sometimes critical hires as we call them internally. But it's looking for those who are, are who have already been working in the industry to bring their expertise to NASA for a specific skill set or area that we think. So you, uh, you're a federal employee, correct, with NASA? You That's work for the federal government. Um, advantages, disadvantages uh, of being in that or, or being, having a federal uh, government job uh, that you've seen? Because jobs in space have really changed I, in your time for different companies that are involved in, in, this, in the space industry, if you will. Yeah, they have. There's, there's benefits to, to working on both sides of that partnership. Um, you know, as a civil servant, I don't necessarily get, uh, you know, as high a pay. So that might consider into someone's choice which route they want to go. Um, but I'm often, uh, you know, afforded better job stability. Um, you know, the caveat to that is, of course, we are ebbing and flowing with 
uh, the, the political direction of the country. So there might be shutdowns. We've seen several over the past uh, couple of decades, um, you know, for various reasons. And so you are not working during that time frame, and then you have to catch up when you, when you come back on. Uh, so there's different challenges and benefits and, and pros and cons to each. Uh, I'd say that if someone would like to really dive into, you know, the, the pros and cons, the benefits of serving on either the contract side or as a civil servant, there's a number of great uh, resources that we have linked off of our HR portal, uh, nasa.gov. We talked about you going to Iowa State and what you, you know, your majors, where, where else are you seeing people in your type of positions or people that you see, where, sit beside or, or other locations, where are they going to school? What are they uh, majoring in or what kind of experiences are, are they gaining? Um, and is there a pathway to get there by not going to college? Great question. Um, so typically we hire folks that are, um, or hold a, a college degree or are working towards getting a college degree. Um, because of the technical nature of our work um, and the baseline knowledge that you need to have to enter into some of our certification flows uh, to become a flight controller. Uh, but there are, um, there are other opportunities around our center uh, that don't necessarily require a college degree. However, uh, the blanket rule of thumb is you need to have a technical degree, a, a bachelor's in science um, uh, for working in engineering here at JC or working uh, in flight operations. Uh, part of our center support, though, uh, is on the logistics, HR, and business side. So we have an entire CFO office here at Johnson Space Center. So those who have uh, maybe a, a, an associate degree uh, in accounting or finance or business background, uh, there are also opportunities for them to pursue the USRA internships that I mentioned, the, um, the Pathways internships that I mentioned, as well as the full-time hiring. We're looking for talent and leadership across the board. So in general, uh, a college degree is, is required or needed um, unless it's significantly augmented by um, industry experience. So as a high school student, and I know we even have some middle school students joining us here, how do they prepare to, to be ready to, to get into that training, that education that, that end up someday could have a position like yours or work in the, in the, in the space industry, which continues to evolve? That's a great question. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think there's, there's not a set path for everyone. Uh, folks that are listening today should realize that there's not a checklist of things that you need to do or, uh, you know, a, a path blazed before you that you have to follow um, to, if your goal is to work for NASA someday or, or if your goal is to work in X, Y, or Z industry uh, someday, there's not a set way to get there. Um, and as I look around at how I got to where I'm at, as I look at my coworkers and the people that I interface with, uh, we all have vastly different routes that we took to get to where we're at. Um, ultimately, you should be, uh, folks that are listening in should be focused on what is my goal? And in, in looking at how I'm involved in either extracurriculars or the coursework that I'm deciding to take, or as I'm wrestling with what major to choose in college, is that in support of that goal? Um, and as you're wrestling with those decisions and as you're trying to figure out if that's on your path towards getting to your goal, your career goal, uh, look for wise counsel around you. Look for mentors, look for programs like CAPS uh, that can connect you with professionals or people in that industry to help you decide if this is a wise choice for you. You know, solicit those opinions, bounce ideas off of them. Realize that your, your educational journey and your preparation for your goals is not something that you have to do alone. You should seek people to be around you. Yeah, I, you know, I'm sure you get involved in some hiring and some, you sit in some interviews and new people coming in. Um, what are the characteristics of, of, the, uh, of the candidates you see coming in that you put um, a lot of value on? And then what are some mistakes that you've seen along the way uh, in some training or experience uh, of some candidates that have come in or tried to get in that you would really not recommend uh, to try and get to that pathway or endpoint? Sure thing, uh, I'll answer that in two parts. So um, I have been fortunate to, so now that I've gone through the Pathways program, I've been serving in some, some leadership positions. I've, I've been, been on our team for a long time. I, I have been a part of some of the selection process that we have for the Pathways internship program. And I won't, I won't spill all the beans on it, but I will say that NASA is very intentional about 
looking for the competencies and the leadership and those sorts of traits in the next generation so that when we are looking at what does our support need to be in 2024, what does it need to be in those future years, um, we have the pipeline established and the people that are excited to be a part of that mission. And so when you're looking at, uh, if you're considering applying to NASA for any of those opportunities, think about how you fit into that picture. Think about how your experiences that you've had or the education that you pursued translates into what our agency is looking for and what our agency is looking to do. I'd say the candidates that we review and that we interview are always stronger when they understand what our mission is and can tell us what we're trying to do versus us having to tell them. Um, and, it, and you really set yourself apart when you're able to articulate, here's how I and my experience and my leadership and my strengths fit into supporting your mission. So always be thinking about that. Um, could you repeat the second part of your question again? Was it a- you know, I guess we're, Yeah, I guess on the opposite side, the ones that have come in uh, successfully and moved forward, what characteristics, but the other side where um, you've seen, you know, that they, this happens across the board, but somebody says, well, this is the pathway I needed to get to, to, to be in mission control. Um, where can people make assumptions uh, wrong assumptions in trying to follow a pathway like you did? Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll answer this kind of with two different perspectives. The first is getting, getting there, getting that opportunity. Um, the routes that I mentioned before are the, the best routes to keep an eye out for, pathways, USRA, the, the full-time postings, fresh out of college, and then the critical hires that we put out. Both of those latter two, I didn't mention this earlier, are, are usually posted on USA Jobs. If you Google USA, J-O-B-S, uh, that'll sure. be the top hit that comes up. Um, so keep an eye out for those opportunities. Um, so when you're preparing yourself for that, um, realize that, again, there's no set path to getting into NASA, but you can always be ready to explain how you fit into um, the big picture and how you are understanding the commitment that you're making to what the opportunity to work in the mission control or on our engineering teams are. I think, so the other perspective uh, on answering your question is I think sometimes we do hire top talent folks that are motivated to be here, but they get into the job and they realize that the job isn't quite uh, what they expected or a good fit for them. I think the interesting thing about our culture from both a management standpoint and from a leadership standpoint is we always try to look for opportunities for team members to bring their strengths forward, even if they're not a natural fit or a good fit for one of the positions that they've been hired into. And so um, I've seen numerous times over my career, um, even with myself, I've had some conversations with management about satisfaction with a project or dissatisfaction with an assignment. Um, and when you come in and you're looking to be a part of the team and you recognize that you're there as a team and you are able to speak with your management about, uh, and it really is general advice probably for anywhere, but I know it, it, it's definitely conversations that we have uh, at NASA. When you speak with your management about changes that need to occur in order for you to be a more effective team member or a more effective leader for our, our goals and our missions, those conversations are always welcomed. So don't worry about the path to get there. Just understand how you fit into the mission. And once, if you're fortunate enough to start working in an industry like, like a JSC or NASA, um, understand that if you need to make a shift or an adjustment, talk and be proactive with your management about that. You know, and you're in a very technical field, and, uh, you know, I would even say by stereotype, um, you know, the soft skills, if you will, um, there's probably some challenges through there just based on personality types that you see. Uh, getting good grades, the technical skills, talk about the soft skill side of things that, that you've uh, had to develop or evolve into uh, to, to be successful in the, in the world you're in. Um, I guess in this world and other worlds, right? Yeah. Uh, soft skills will get you far in life. Um, there is, I think earlier in my career, I had wished that I had taken uh, some additional uh, communication coursework in college or uh, been a little bit more active in refining my soft skills. Uh, you know, people to people, relationship wise. Uh, I wasn't, I, I'm naturally not uh, an introvert. I'm a little bit more of an extrovert. So relating to folks and having conversations comes a little bit more naturally to me, but I have a lot of peers and friends who are more introverted um, and that does not come as naturally to them. Um, and it's not think, a negative or a positive. That's just two no, people. No, it's not. 
Right. Yeah, it's no, no, it's not. But it, it, but more importantly, and the lesson to take from that is that you are going to be, you as an individual are going to be serving on a team or part of a, a broader team, and you need to be aware of people's preferred communication style. So if you want to set yourself up for success and set your team up for success, you should spend some time thinking intentionally about how you're coming across to, to folks, how they're coming across and putting yourself in their shoes, so to speak. Um, again, as you mentioned, the work that we do is sometimes extremely technical. Um, the, the communication that we have on console is very concise, very direct. And if I spoke to say my wife that way at home, um, <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be sleeping on the couch, uh, mm-hmm. or it'd be misinterpreted for another way. But you, you have to recognize that there's different communication styles for, for different situations. And you have to understand when people are speaking to you, there's a reason for that as well. Um, so we train that actually when it comes to mission control, we train the soft skills that are required to sit on console, to speak into your headset, to communicate to your flight director or your, your other flight control team members or the, or the crew members, the astronauts on board. That's something we actively work on with everyone, regardless of what your natural, um, approach is, regardless of what your natural, um, communication style is. Uh, we want folks to recognize how that style can lend itself to the calm that's needed in that controlled and very critical environment. That doesn't translate always back to the office. You don't want right. to sit down and practice water cooler talk that would be odd and not helpful. But you have to recognize that when you're back in your team or wherever you're serving, whatever job you get into, you should be thinking about how you're coming across. You'd be thinking about how others are coming across to you and why that's occurring. Um, and if the, the environment lends itself talk openly and listen actively to why folks are, are talking that way. So we've got a lot of good questions coming in and not just about, um, you know, your job, your career, your pathway. People want to know, you know, this is a new thing coming on. So I know one of our affiliate schools, one of the science teachers has come in. Uh, she has a number one question that she gets from her high school students. Why return to the moon since we've already been there? That's a fantastic question. I know one that's been raised, uh, well, goodness, ever since any idea of returning the moon has been floated uh, since the 1970s. Um, It's the same question of why do we explore anywhere? Why do we perform any sort of scientific research? Or at least it can be distilled down to that. There's still so much that we do not know and that we will not know unless we go. And so our decision to go enables us to ask harder questions, perform additional research, discover additional information. We sent probes to the moon over the last several decades that have provided strong evidence for water uh, at the poles where there is permanent shadow cast over the the lunar surface and regolith. Um, But we won't be able to confirm that it's there or what uh, form it's in or uh, any other items until we put humans on the surface. Um, Additionally, this serves as a strategic stepping stone for us to go to Mars eventually. Um, You could probably ask the same question about why go to Mars. Uh, Isn't isn't that a a ton of resource and time and effort to do? The answer is yes, it is. But it's worth it because of all the benefits and questions that we can ask and answer on that journey to getting to Mars and when we're there. Um, The same question was posed to, to those who are supporting the Apollo program. Uh, when Kennedy uh, proclaimed that we would put a man on the moon by the end of the century, the same question was asked. And when we reflect or look back on all the benefits and the development that occurred during that time frame, uh, those technologies, the information, the discovery, uh, the, the, the technical workforce that was developed during that time frame have provided uh, almost immeasurable benefits to our culture and the world uh, over the last several decades. So. It's really, really exciting uh, to be thinking about the moon. You know, it's, it's, it's a crazy thing, but there are tangible and real and strategic benefits to returning astronauts to the lunar surface. Well, and you look back and you talked about some of the developments, you know, Velcro, and you could probably name three or four or a dozen other technologies that we use today uh, on Earth that were developed just through the work in how do you get to space, uh, you know, how do you get to the moon, and then, you know, from the shuttle program, things like that, um, you know, this is what it's it'll be nine years uh coming up uh it's later this month that we're gonna we're gonna do manned space flight again talk about the energy a resurgence of energy that you're seeing uh in the space program from your position and even internally with with nasa um that we're putting you know we're coming back to space from 
the United States. Yeah, that's 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 a great point. So I, I failed to mention earlier uh, that in uh, two weeks time from today, we're scheduled to launch US crew members aboard a SpaceX, SpaceX Dragon capsule. So that's a US rocket uh, from American soil, which is something we haven't done in nearly a decade since shuttle retired in 2011. Um, so we are at a really exciting time in uh, NASA history to be putting U.S. astronauts back in space uh, through that method. Um, I think, you know, we've always had an ongoing, uh, I did mention ongoing presence in space for the last 20 years. Uh, that, I think, because of just how our culture has evolved and uh, folks lose attention of some of these crazy, amazing things, or it becomes um, something that you, uh, you see and you say, oh, yeah, I already knew that. Um, now we're starting to take major steps forward um, in, re in increasing our capability. Now we've been given this big, crazy goal to get back to the lunar surface by 2024. And we're starting to make tangible steps forward in um, moving in that direction. So partner partnerships with our industry partners, doing things differently than how NASA has done them in the past. We farm out a lot of the work or we hire on our industry partners to provide support. We solicit the entire nation for ideas of how to tackle these really hard problems. Uh, and really our leadership has shifted from bring it in-house, develop it in-house, fly in-house, to how can we forge the right partnerships and everything else. So that shift in mindset over the last probably seven, eight years has really, uh, I think, propelled us forward uh, and gotten us a lot more exposure in the public side and really set us up for success because we're diversifying how we're tackling these sure, challenges. Sure, sure. Uh, a couple quick questions. We last couple of minutes here with David Lance, uh, who's in flight operations uh, at Houston, um, Johnson Space Center in Houston uh, with NASA. Uh, Space Force, talk about that. Any connection there? Where do, you, where do you see that going for what you can tell us? I'm sure it's on the down low uh, for, for what it is. Talk through that. I, I will just say that, um, that is a part of our defense uh, defense posture as a nation. NASA um, has always collaborated with um, our defense agencies, whether it be the Air Force uh, uh, in, in the past or, or currently. Um, most of those are uh, collaborative efforts to ensure that our NASA missions are safe. And what I mean by that primarily is things like uh, debris in space, tracking of that, and getting out of the way of debris in low Earth orbit on the International Space Station, um, and ensuring that um, our missions uh, have the right communication assets and protections and other things. Um, we do not have um, a direct tie to the missions uh, or the flights that those, those agencies are, are pursuing. Um, we are primarily focused on humans in space, uh, at, at Johnson Space Center at least. Um, we have a uh, number of uncrewed, uh, unmanned uh, space exploration missions that get flown out of JPL, uh, research uh, and flights that are done out of Glenn, Marshall, uh, Ames. Uh, I won't list all the centers, but a lot of different missions, but primarily we're focused on human space flight, which the Space Force is not. So let's think back. Uh, <clears throat> you're in the seats of, I guess, with the high school students that we have here. Um, and thinking back then of aspirations, uh, to, to maybe work for NASA. Um, what advice do you give to your younger self? You know, knowing what you know now, you know, and the pathways and, and the work, that type of thing. What, what do you tell the young David Lance? Young David Lance should have realized that he was in a three-year job interview when he was doing internships. <laughs> um, that was told to me, but it didn't sink in, I think, the way that it could have. Uh, I was fortunate enough to A, get the, get the internship in the first place, and B, get a full-time position uh, when I was hired, but there were a few missteps that I took just in taking advantage of the projects, the teams that I was on, uh, everything else. I could have made more of those opportunities. So if someone else finds themselves in a similar situation, and it does not need to be you know, with NASA or part of any of the programs that I was talking about earlier, it can be in any job that you're in, any internship that you're in. Realize that you're in an extended interview and you need to be putting your best foot forward and you need to be representing your strengths uh, to the best of your abilities. So I'm going to bet that the 
biggest credit you can give to your success, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, she's on here, but she, she didn't want you to know, but Susan, your mother. Uh, Good, I was going to say in. my mom, but uh, I didn't want to interrupt you. <laughs> yeah, you, you give credit to Susan, so she was like, is he going to know if I log in? I was like, well, he may or may not, but uh, he, she didn't want to make you nervous. Uh, David, thank you again uh, for joining us. If people want to connect with you or follow you, any social media or an email or anything like that, that, that uh, these young people can, can reach out to you on. Uh, sure. You're, you're welcome to follow me on, on Twitter or Instagram. Just search David Lance. Uh, I believe I'm one of the few up there. Uh, I don't post all that often. I do reply to everyone that, that, that hits me up. I'm not a huge social media <laughs> uh, buff. Uh, that's not my forte. Um, but also, I'd, I'd invite, maybe I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, Nate, but if other folks have additional questions, I'd be happy to have those filtered through you. Or I, yeah. I was watching the scroll of all the questions go today, and I know <laughs> I got to a fraction of them. Uh, so yep. if you'd like to compile those, I'd be happy to type up a quick reply uh, to those that we can provide back to the. Yeah, the there's there are some very interesting ones, but yeah. uh, uh, we got a very good those. session. <laughs> very good session. Uh, thank you again, David, for joining us. Uh, and our NASA continues as uh, Raji Chari is coming up, uh, not next, but later on. So uh, NASA Day continues uh, with our Cedar Valley concession. Uh, so as you look on the screen right now, Kurt Hudnut coming up uh, next. Uh, then Roger Chari and then uh, Heather Marquez uh, to finish off day number three. Uh, go to preparingforpurpose.org uh, to register for that. Um, again, uh, there's our, our recordings from the last couple of days. Want to thank Matic uh, for developing the video that we had. We started uh, along with some of our marketing work, Sea Valley Caps and the Caps Network for putting together this uh, amazing session, um, amazing sessions, if you will. And we look forward to having you back. David, thank you again. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it, Nate. Ethan, thank you as well. And uh, I appreciate uh, all the time y'all gave for me to ramble on today. All right. Go Cyclones, go Tigers. Go Cyclones, go Tigers. We'll see you soon. <laughs>